I'm Susan Shapiro, and um, I uh, joined CAST just about less than a year ago, and um, I had the opportunity recently to meet David Rose for the first time. And um, he came to CAST and he gave a talk, and he said that it was a relatively new talk, and that we might be watching him see his slide in what seems like the first time, it might seem a little clunky. And I thought, that's kind of how I feel sometimes when I put things together. So um, you may watch me look up and think, what is that slide? Um, I've done a lot of um, teaching in the last week, and so um, I'll try to stay focused. Does this clicker? Yeah, that's it. I, um, it's a little bit delayed. OK. I was a teacher originally. I wanted to be the next Annie Sullivan. I worked as a self-contained classroom teacher. I worked as a general education classroom teacher. I was one of New Hampshire, where I'm from, a first inclusion facilitators, a special education teacher that didn't have a classroom. My job was to support teachers, to support all kids, to be successful. Um, I did a lot of consultation around inclusive education through the University of New Hampshire for many years, um, ran a teacher education program at Plymouth State University for the last decade, um, and now I'm working at CAST. And in all of it, I feel like my love of teachers has just simply grown. And the sort of working title for this talk um, was this, I think I called it professional learning turned inside out, but it could have been called the tenderness of teachers. Not tenderness as in the tenderness that teachers extend to learners, but the tenderness that, that teachers walk around with every single day. That feeling that you're working as hard as you can possibly be working, and yet there are still students and learners that you carry in your belly on the way home that you still haven't reached. And you drive to work in the morning again, and I remember feeling like, I'm probably not gonna reach them again. And I think that's the promise of universal design for learning. But I want to really acknowledge that we come into this work as educators with a lot of vulnerability. Anything I say today that you like is really not my work. It's the work of this team that I am part of at CAST. Um, we have a project called New Hampshire UDL Innovation Network. We have 43 schools that we're working with to implement UDL. Is there a funny sound echo, or does it sound OK? OK. Um, and anything I say today that you don't like is probably just me. So um, we'll give them the credit, and I'll take the blame. I won't talk about anything on this list other than you. I want you to see it, um, to understand that what I am going to talk about, the UDL instructional rounds work that we're doing, is part of a larger whole. Um, these are the things that happen for teams in the network. It's a small team capacity building model, and I'm happy to talk more about it with you um, after this talk today. So I think at this point in the conference, you're probably tired. Um, if you're like me, you're freezing um, because you wore Florida clothes. I live in New Hampshire. I have a wood stove, and I can't wait to go back to it to get warm. Um, and um, you, your mind is probably full. You probably have also heard a lot that the goal of UDL is expert learning. Not good students, but really expert learners. Um, and you probably have noticed that the colors between these two diagrams are the same, and that it's not a coincidence. That it's in the provision of intentional learning design options that we give learners the opportunity to become expert learners. If we just say open the book to page 72, and do numbers 1 through 14, we're kind of saying to learners, I know the goal and you just follow me around. But when we give learners the goal and we give learners options for how to get there, then we're giving learners the opportunity to become expert learners. I'm hoping this next um, little bit is going to work. And if it doesn't, if somebody who's good with technology can run up here, I'd be so grateful. Um, this is the voice of a learner describing UDL. I am a learner. If you hope I become purposeful and motivated, you have to first recruit my interest. Then you have to help me sustain effort and persistence because ultimately I have to develop the internal capacity to self-regulate while learning. And if you hope I become resourceful and knowledgeable, you have to first be sure I can perceive the learning content and you have to help me make meaning of language and symbols, because ultimately I want to be able to comprehend whatever I encounter in this world. And if you hope 
I become strategic and goal-directed, and all of these sound like very good goals for my life. You have to give me multiple ways to physically act during learning and multiple ways to express and communicate because ultimately I want to be able to employ executive function skills in the varied context I will face. Thank you. Those are the words of a learner describing what it would be like to have all of those options um, provided in the curriculum. But imagine that those are the, are the words of a teacher. What would professional learning look like if we really regarded teachers as expert learners? This is a picture from a training that we did just on a Monday of this week. And it was a wonderful professional learning opportunity. But we stood at the front, and people sat down in the seats, and we had the goals, and we had the curriculum, and we designed the activities. Um, and I'm not so sure that we really embodied the truth, not even just the belief, but the truth, that learners, the teachers, are expert learners. What would professional learning look like if we really regarded teachers as already coming to us and coming to the work as purposeful and motivated? resourceful and knowledgeable, strategic and goal-directed? We are trying to answer that question by doing some experimental work and implementation and professional learning, by implementing, by using instructional rounds, not so much as a means of evaluating somebody's capacity to implement UDL, but using instructional rounds as a means for people to understand UDL by learning from their own practice. So not learning about UDL from me, but me helping you learning about, learn about UDL from you. What I'm going to do in the next couple of minutes, and I'd love a five minute warning if someone's willing to give that to me, thanks, um, is just tell you not how it should go or what we did that's perfect, but just to tell you what's been happening. Um, and I'm gonna talk through about eight steps, um, can tell you what happens in schools when we do this. The first thing we do is we ask teams to um, state a professional learning goal, to ask a question, I should say. In the most organic, pure process, teams would come up with their own instructional question. We're providing that question because these teams have signed on to be part of a UDL network, and so the question that they are asking and want to answer is related to universal design for learning. So the question that we start with with every team, although it changes as we go through multiple rounds over the year, is what evidence is there that the learning at this school here is designed to support expert learning for all students? Not is it or where is it not, but what evidence is there? It's a strength-based model. Teams of five to eight people have clipboards and post-it notes and we use this graphic organizer to help them take data. And we do some pre-meetings that I won't go through now. Um, but our first mission is to go around and do 10-minute observations. We observe in five classrooms at most, three minimum. We observe only in the UDL team member classrooms. And we write down three things, four things. First, is the learning goal clear? As we're watching the, t the instruction, can we tell what the learning goal is? What are the learners doing and saying? What is the teacher doing and saying? And what's happening in the environment? Because especially at the elementary level, but at all levels, um, lots of the options for self-regulation, executive function, and comprehension don't live in the lessons per se, but they live in the learning environment. I should just check, say that when I talk to teachers ahead of time and they're nervous, I tell them, if you happen to, to like, you know, hit this lesson out of the park, no one's gonna say good job. And if this lesson goes really poorly, no one's gonna say that was a poor lesson. No one's ever gonna talk about your lesson because we're not looking at your lesson, we're looking at school-wide trends. We're trying to see patterns and themes. So teachers scribble on this um, graphic organizer. I scribble on a graphic organizer. We take a lot of data. Then we sit and we write the data that's relevant to the question on a post-it note. One piece of data, one post-it note. And then the sorting begins. 
the first challenge I give to the team is to say, sort this by the principles of the guidelines. What evidence, and we put things around the room, so there's a poster on one side that says engagement, a poster over here that says representation, and action and expression over here. And teachers walk around with post-it notes that say, the teacher said, today we're going to learn to use dialogue and story writing. And they go, where does that go? And they walk around. I had this one great paraeducator who came up to me and she said, I want you to know, I'm completely nervous about this. I have no idea where the data will go. And by the end of it, like you would go over and put yours over here, and she would go, that doesn't go over there. <laughs> She's going to run it to the other side. Um, watching it as a professional learning person, I see lots of learning going on in that moment, just in the sorting of the data to the principles of the guidelines. I also want to note that my role in this, I come in and I'm sort of like the mother goose saying, it's okay, this is what we're going to do, I've got this, I've got your back. By the end, I do nothing. Um, and that's very purposeful. So the first thing we do is sort it by the principles. The next thing we do is we sort it by the guidelines. So we organize, and it's sort of organic and it depends on the number of people. But we organize people to say, how about the three of you go over there and just go analyze that engagement data. And the three of you come over here and analyze the representation data. And the three of you go over there and analyze the action and expression data. Everybody's on a team. People will then take the data around one of the principles and separate it out by the guidelines. So looking at under the, for, for example, engagement, which evidence really is evidence of recruiting interest? What do we have here that's evidence of sustaining effort and persistence? What evidence do we have here that the curriculum is providing options for self-regulation? And the way that it looks, um, if you follow me on Twitter, and that is not a plug that you should follow me on Twitter, I don't tweet very much, but um, uh, you'll notice though that I post a lot of photos of this work, and the organization of this work is so different in every school. And then we just study it. And the team starts to identify school-wide trends, themes, patterns. For example, although this is not, um, the only example, there are like millions, but for one example is that somebody said one time recently, you know, our school is really, really good at providing options for comprehension. Kids can get the content in a number of ways. And we're really, really good at providing supports for learners around executive functions. But boy, we just don't provide options for self-regulation. It's kind of like if you can't hold it together, why don't you go over there, right? We just don't say, if you can't hold it together, here's some things you might do. Whereas we do that for some other things. So they really wanted to align some of their social emotional learning initiatives with their UDL work and build in options school-wide for self-regulation. And that's, this is the part when I kind of sit down and they huddle and I say, now you, well, let me back, go backwards. Each of the small teams reports out to the large group. So we hear from the engagement people, this is what we found. And the representation people, this is what we found. We analyze the data, here's the synthesis of it, um, and here are some recommendations that we have for what we might want to dig into as a school. And then I sit down, and the team huddles, and the team starts to think about where are the opportunities for our instructional growth? What might we want to dig into a little bit? What kinds of um, curricular decisions might we want to explore? Never in this process does anyone ever have the, really the space to say, or the inclination to say, I wish we could just have different learners. It's all about what we can do in the curriculum, and I think that's where the hope comes in, right? I can't change that learner, but I can change that learning. and teams determine the next level of work. If we want learners who are purposeful and motivated, what do we need to add to our curriculum to give them more opportunity to be so? If we want learners to be more resourceful and knowledgeable, how do we build opportunities for that to happen? This is just a summary of the steps. These are the materials, there are three. I don't come in with a PowerPoint or a slideshow or anything more than a copy of expert learner characteristics, a copy of the guidelines, 
and a Subaru full of post-it notes. <laughs> and there are two things that inform this work for me per, that are personal. Two things that I heard about professional learning that have never really stopped me, um, that have never really proven untrue. In fact, I think about them probably every day. The first is that 90, somebody said, and I don't know who, 99% of professional learning stops at the classroom door meaning we change things, we learn things, but what actually happens between you and that learner, that teacher and that learner, stays basically the same, and that keeps me up at night, right? That makes me say, we've got to look at instruction. I had one teacher, one school that was, that was a school that was facing lots of school management problems said, this is the first conversation about instruction we've had in 10 years, and we're both embarrassed and excited to say that. The second is something that has been, um, applicable to my work with teacher education students, my work with students when I was a teacher, my <laughs> work as a mother of four daughters, um, and that is this wonderful quotation from Deborah Meyer, who says, we used to think that teaching was telling and learning was listening. We now know that learning is telling and teaching is listening. Teachers are expert learners. How do we build professional learning models that listen? Thank you.